crazy few weeks here. Let's see if we can get my screen up and going here. Okay, you see my database window now? Yes, this is, this is, we've had a couple of interesting vascular cases recently, and I'll start with this one. This is a patient who had, they have a large bore right internal jugular catheter, and then they had this dialysis catheter placed in the left internal jugular vein. And at this point, it's kind of along the lateral wall of the superior vena cava. They got a CT. Of, this was like a few days later, and now you can see that the catheter looks like it's traversing outside of this of the superior vena cava, and there's gas that's in the mediastinum. You know, certainly not in the right atrial appendage. It's too anterior and too high for well, too, more too high for that. And there's a little bit of stranding around it. As you can see, all the way down here is where the pericardium starts and the right atrial appendage. So, you know, this thing is, you know, we told them we think it's outside of the lumen, and I think they were in a little bit of disbelief. I'm trying to find a good window to show this the best, but uh, they weren't using it at this point in time, and and I don't know if it was functioning or not. So they repeated the next day with contrast, and this is the study that I saw, and. Clearly, you know, that no longer looks like it's tenting, or there's no doubt that that's not tenting the superior vena cava. And all of that gas and stuff surrounding it has resolved. So then the, the question with our interventional uh, cardiologists and interventional radiologists was, what do we do about this at this point? Because it's a pretty large thing, and even though there's no bleeding there, Right now, they didn't want to just pull it out, so they used the they used the IVC to get access into the superior vena cava. And I'll just show you a few of the fluoroscopic images. You can clearly see this thing's outside of there. And so they were injecting it, and again, no surprise, there's no extravasation. And so they just gently pulled this out under fluoro. And uh, let's see, this one, no, it's this one when they just start to pull it while they're watching. You can see the hand up here on the left IJ pulling it back into the brachycephalic vein and then shoot it right after that and there's nothing so you know i think it was in the in the lumen but for whatever reason had sealed itself off it had been in there a few days and there was really no bleeding into the mediastinum and then the follow-up radiograph there's really nothing in that area either there's just, just pulmonary vessels <coughs> so i don't know i haven't seen an example like this, you know, where there wasn't more bleeding around it. What do you guys think? Any comments? Yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe it. I don't know. Maybe it thrombosed around it, or it's such a. I don't know. Probably, yeah. They did say that, that he had a coagulopathy, and and you can see there's a little bit of of thrombus more inferiorly in the SVC. So I don't know if that was related to the to the vessel injury or not, but I just thought that was interesting. And uh, I liked their idea of maintaining access in the in the SVC with the anticipation of, of having to balloon it if necessary. So along the vascular theme, this one is is much less of a diagnostic dilemma. And I think it's always good if, if there's any you know, residents that are starting call soon or just started call for things like this. This was picked up by one of our new second year residents. And of course, this right IJ catheter takes an unusual course. It goes left of midline and projects over the aorta. So in general, you know, just starting from a simple approach, it could be either in some sort of variant vein, it could be extravascular or it could be arterial. In this case, he called, they did a transducer and it was arterial. So this was placed in the ICU with ultrasound guidance. And I think, I know from back in my days of, of IR guided, of ultrasound guided procedures, you know, it's easy to lose track of the tip of your needle. And I think that's what happened in this case. Um, they probably thought they saw the tip of the needle, but weren't actually seeing it. And one thing that's interesting, so you, you would expect that this is going into the carotid artery, and maybe the carotid should be a little bit more medial to that. But it actually goes, so they spear the internal jugular vein and it goes into the subclavian artery rather than the carotid artery. And so of course, with these, 
they have to dilate with a sheath. So there's a big hole in that artery to get it in there. And unfortunately, you know, but not unsuspectingly, they had to do a, a mini median schnotomy to take this out. So two catheter misadventures that we've seen recently. Travis, one uh, other thought I had, uh, your, your point about the ultrasound. Also, I think yeah. sometimes they um, also go through and through the vein. They get you know, they get access yeah. to the vein and they may move the transducer and keep sticking. Yeah. Or if it's a hypotensive patient, they may have very you know, flat veins and it just goes right through. Because um, it's it's I, I don't know about you, but I, at our institution, all lines have to be placed under ultrasound guidance. Yet we still see arterial lines probably about the same frequency yeah. as we did before. Yeah, I, I don't know if all of them have to be placed under ultrasound here. I'll have to check with the policy, but I mean, I just know how easy it is to lose track of the tip. So you're right, and if they're if they're in a volume depleted state, then sure it can be you know, easy to go right through it. And then this one's pretty is pretty impressive. Let me go make sure I have the right order. I think, yeah. This is a young woman who, 2010, had a pneumonia and or, or presented with pneumonia and was diagnosed with pneumonia. And you can see it's in the right lower lobe. And interestingly, there's a couple little air fluid levels in here. You know, this is easy to see in retrospect. So this is called pneumonia. She got a non-contrast CT around the same time to further evaluate this or this was later after it had somewhat improved. And you can still see this is a really weird looking cystic lesion in the medial right lower lobe. And you know, at this time, unfortunately, it was a non-contrast study. You can probably suspect, you know, if you see something like this, suspect that there may be some congenital component to this, like a CPAM or a sequestration. Uh, she, so it's just called pneumonia with some cavitary components. It gets follow up. Yeah, it's now called better. This is like 2012. Uh, and she's had a couple of recurrent pneumonias in this right lower lobe. And then she had an outside radiograph, which I don't have, recurrent pneumonia this year, and then got this CT with contrast. So this is almost 10 years later. And you can see still the same, you know, a little less severe, but still same cystic collection of things and then of course on the this study you can see there's a massive arterial feeder to this right lower lobe probably from the inferior phrenic artery maybe a separate branch right at the uh right at the diaphragm here but yeah this was a large sequestration they just called it that i asked if it was one of the hybrid lesions like that we have shown before uh, you know, the pathologist wasn't sure, but I think when you look at the the airway anatomy, you can see superior segmental bronchus, and then really only see three different segments. I don't see a a, a posterior basal segment necessarily, or maybe th actually this is probably posterior basal and no medial basal segment. So maybe a spectrum of of bronchial atresia with sequestration. The other thing that's interesting about this is that you can see. And I thought this was kind of cool because the pathologist commented on it was that there's actually atherosclerosis in this arterial feeder. And I guess my question for you, for the group, it would be why would that form in somebody who's in their 30s? I don't know if it's like if there's a higher flow through this because it's going then to pulmon pulmonary you know, venous circulation, but some of that calcification was present even 10 years ago, which I think is also in that vessel. That I'm is curious a what you question. Think. <laughs> Well, that, that's a classic finding, uh, Travis, the, to have premature atherosclerosis in the systemic artery that goes to uh, sequestration. The other thing, I mean, there is a lot of flow going through this because just look at the size of that artery yeah. for the volume of lung that's being supplied. So it's, it's basically, it's a low pressure system that it's dumping into. There's a lot of flow through it. It's tortuous. And so it's prone to uh, atherosclerosis. So, um, Premature atherosclerosis is a classic finding in the artery that feeds the sequestration. Cool. Okay. I think that's the first time I remember noticing that. So, 
All right, and then one last one to continue on the, the vascular theme. I think this is, when I saw this, I actually saw CT, which I'll show you in a moment, but when I look back at this radiograph from also from a few years ago, almost 15 years ago now, I think this is maybe the best example of an arterial venous malformation I've ever seen on a radiograph. And you can see, you can clearly see just the dilated tangle inflow and outflow vessels in this case. And so this is a patient who had an, has known HHT and they came to our HHT center. So one of our interventional radiologists does basically nothing but embolize AVMs. You can see this is it back then. And they embolized this with coils at, at an outside hospital. And so they came back to assess for recanalization now. And so for, you know, whenever we see any filling of the vein draining this thing, then it suggests that there's recanalization. So these are huge, massive coils there. And then this is the vein, which is still widely patent in draining that arterial venous malformation. And the problem with this, this lesion in particular, which is why it's probably not going to be treated by interventional radiology and may need a lobectomy, is the fact that now there are very large uh, transpleural collaterals. You can see these intercostals have dilated over time. And I think maybe this venous space shows them better. Yeah. And, and so after discussion with our interventionalist, he said that, that because of this, the recruitment of the systemic supply, that this really pretends a bad prognosis in terms of trying to treat this with additional embolization. So this is something we always look for in these cases that have been treated previously in addition to recanalization of that. So, and this patient did, oh, go ahead, Howard. So you have a lesion that is, in a sense, recruiting in some fashion. What is the pathophysiology of recruitment of transpural vessels? I'm trying to think if I've ever well, seen such a thing. I, 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 you know, there's not a lot of literature on this in this specific instance, but I would guess it's because they're coiling the artery you know, and limiting supply there, and then it's just recruiting other supply. I don't know. I'm just, I'm guessing, and it's not a, it's not a great explanation, but oh, I didn't see, see that. Are they going to resect it, Travis, since they can't invo it? That's probably, that's, that's where it's headed. Oh. Yeah. And she did have a couple of others. Uh, you know, she has this, you can see smaller ones that can be treated. We use these little microvascular plugs. I don't know what your interventionalists use these days, but they're, I think I've shown one. I could try and show another one too. That, but they can get into really small vessels, and it's nice too that they don't cause streak artifact. So it's easy to evaluate the lesions afterwards too. But yeah, Howard, I don't have a good explanation for the oh, you know, you know, for the development of those. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, Jeff, that's it for me. All right, thanks, Travis. Okay, who wants to go next? I have some cases. All right. There you go, Seth. Uh, all right, so I will show this case first. This is kind of interesting. Um, so this is a a meth user and um, he was sent to us for evaluation for CTEF because he has severe RVH, pretty impressively hypertrophied right ventricle. Um, and on the outside hospital, he was diagnosed with having CTEF. And if you look, unfortunately, even though this was a uh, we have a pretty delayed bolus about seven seconds after it hits the PA. This guy's flow through the PA is quite slow. You can even see swirling in the PA. And that this is not a PE, that's, that's smoke uh, artifact. It's kind of a nice example of smoke artifact. Um, but you know, the question is, well, what is, what is this material here uh, lining the PAs? Is, it, you know, is this related to chronic thromboembolic disease? or is this related to in-situ thrombus? And obviously one 
is a surgical treatment and the other is not. Um, you see pretty severe lining thrombus bilaterally. And um, you know, I don't have surgical proof on this one, but there is complete absence of uh, additional disease. So if you look through um, the remaining vasculature, there's no, there's no CTEF. Um, and it's uh, pretty unusual to get just kind of equal layering thrombus at the bifurcation in someone who has um, kind of CTEF. It's just not what it looks like. I can't show the nuke study, but I have, let's show you. So this is the, the dual energy kind of showing that there's no real, I mean, there's a little hypoperfusion in the upper lobes, but nothing that's kind of this focal wedge-like area. Actually, I took a picture of the um, BQ scan showing that there really are no defects, that this is all, the, the shadow here that looks like a defect is all just this massive cardiomegaly. So this is this is just layering in situ thrombus, uh, pretty impressive site in situ thrombus in one of our uh, meth users. Um, so that was case one. This is, yeah, it's just a nice example. I, I haven't seen one of these in, at least on imaging, I haven't seen one in a, a couple of years. Uh, so this is a patient who just had a coronary study um, and, you know, it was, it was from the ED, just figured it was a chest pain coronary. And um, the coronaries look fine. Uh, her LV function is pretty good. Uh, no real wall motion abnormality. There's an extra beat in there. I'm sorry. Uh, one of the phases is out of place. But you can see that the cardiac motion is pretty good. But the, the main issue is that you can notice that the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve is just flopping around. Um, you have massive left atrial enlargement, and here is kind of this flopping around mitral valve leaflet. So this is, uh, I was like looking at it, and I was like, holy crap, you know, it's a flail leaflet. Like this is uh, not, and of course I looked up the patient's history, and she came into the ED and had an echo before this, which demonstrated the flail leaflet, but we all know that flail leaflet, the, by far the most common cause is MI. Um, and this patient had not had an MI, or at least a known MI. She was in good health until a few weeks, like a week before, where she had a complaint of kind of muscle weakness and soreness. Um, so I don't know if it's a myocarditis or not, but after that uh, developed this, um, uh, when she started lying down, noted her legs were swelling. And when she was lying down, she was getting very short of breath. So you can see it's, unfortunately, she has very thin papillary muscles. Um, and you can kind of see that the, here's the anterior leaflet that has this connection with the uh, papillary muscle, but the posterior leaflet, um, there's just a gap. There's, there's nothing there. So uh, as we know, classically, it leads to the uh, jet extending basically from here up into the right superior pulmonary vein because that's where the jet tends to be directed. Th this case didn't have that. She just had more um, just diffuse pulmonary edema. We didn't have a chest radiograph, but the, the scout didn't show any uh, abnormality. And, and it's interesting because these are really, um, you don't sit on these for too long. Uh, the the one-week mortality, and this is all based on infarct, but the you know one-week mortality is pretty high. Um, and the two month mortality is like 92 or 93%. Um, so this is, a, you know, has just as high of mortality as a pseudoaneurysm. But interestingly, this wasn't from infarct. So I, I'm not really sure what it's from. Um, she also has a sigmoid septum. Uh, that's not HCM, that's a sigmoid septum. But they sent her home and they're going to do outpatient surgery on her next week. But I was just surprised that they sent her home with this degree of, uh, in the, in the, the ultrasound just shows a torrent of MR as you would expect. Um, but this is the first case I have seen that's not related to uh, infarct. And there's like associations with certain collagen vascular diseases. Um, you know, they really, once you get outside infarct, the, the causes are pretty in trauma, 
which she doesn't have. The causes are pretty few and far between, and so no one's really sure why this happened to her. Mm. And then the last case is a nice example, not a, I don't think a diagnostic dilemma, at least, um, is, you know, exuberant pleural thickening with soft tissue extending along the pleura with superior retraction of the hyla and this fibrosis. Um, so right now we don't, this guy's on the transplant list. He just came in, just diagnosed with what we're presuming is PPFE. Um, the question I have for the group is, what is the youngest age you've seen PPFE? And then, because this patient's pretty darn young. And then the other question is, um, has anyone seen a case associated with, because the other thing he came in with was profound sense of neural hearing loss. Um, and, you know, has anyone, I mean, seen a case, you know, this guy, this guy's 21. Um, and has anyone seen a case in this young? And has anyone seen a case associated with hearing loss or know why it's associated with hearing loss? Um, I would imagine maybe something to do with proliferation of fibrous tissue, but I don't know. Uh, so, Seth, um, I, we transplanted someone in their early 20s. That's the earliest I've seen, but I don't, I think there was, it was idiopathic with no associated anything. Yeah. We had, okay, so we had somebody that was in their upper 20s who had undergone, I think, chemotherapy in the past for some sort of hematologic malignancy as a kid. Uh, but I can't explain the sensory neuro hearing loss. Yeah, I didn't think maybe if bone proliferation or something like that in the auditory canal or whatever you call it, the canal that has the uh, auditory nerve in it. Um, so, and it, this isn't ankylosing spondylitis by any chance, is it? I mean, he doesn't, you know. Uh, it's a good thought. I, the bones looked. I mean, they looked okay to me. Do we have his SI joints and things like that? So, uh, I don't think so. I can check. I would just wonder if there's some autoimmune thing that's going on, yeah. including, uh, including the uh, neuropathy. HLA B27 might be worth checking. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good thought. I'll actually. That's I'll, my uh, ID or um, ILD guy just texted me and tell me what I thought the diagnosis was. It looks like PPFE. It's like it's too young. I'm like, well, I agree, it's young, but I've I've seen I've seen someone like th in their young 30s, so low, you know, 30, 31. So. Um, you got, you know, that's good that you guys have seen patients who are quite young. Um, I, I'll tell them to check an HLA B27. I, I didn't know that those were associated um, with, with P. I know upper, oh, so that's interesting. So I know <clears throat> ink spawn is associated with upper lobe fibrosis. Is that, is that thought to be PPFE? I've wondered that too, because I've never seen a case that I like, could buy as true upper lobe fibrosis from Thanks, Bon. Yeah, cause we, had, we had one case from National Jewish when I was a resident, and it was pretty prolific. Um, I have to maybe find it because uh, yeah. that's the, last, the only time I've ever seen it. I've seen two old cases from a retired uh, colleague. Uh, she probably showed them to me 10 or 12 years ago that on, on film. That was clearly ink spawn and clearly upper lobe fibrosis. And you know what? It looked like PPFE. It was dense biapical thickening. But I've never seen a case since. And I wonder it's because... We have these good drugs now that people with Angspon just don't get that kind of lung disease. That's very interesting because it's one of those things that's like your last thing on the differential for upper lobe fibrosis. Again, I had one case and an old guy, and um, yeah, that's really interesting that you brought up HLA B27. I'll, I'll have him check. How about uh, how about sarcoid as a cause? Are, are there so, people with so I was so we were wondering, you know, because sarcoid can be associated with hearing loss, but um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if sarcoid can lead to a PPFE-like imaging findings. I, I've, you know, obviously sarcoid's in that can do everything kind of thing. He doesn't have any lymphadenopathy, uh, which obviously doesn't necessarily exclude sarcoid. But um, yeah, it crossed my mind. That that did cross my mind. Yeah, can Can you show the sagittal again? Let's just see how sure. straight his line is. He still has a curve. It's not. It's not a straight spine. 
Okay. Oh, you want to see the spine? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the spine looks good. Okay. All right, I'll have them check, but those are my cases. Awesome. Thank okay. you. All righty. Who would like to go next? I would like to go next. I, Can I go next? Yeah, David, it's fine. I'll go after David. Okay, we'll go David, then Howard. Okay, um, people should be seeing a uh, radiograph uh, with excellent yes. overlap. So we always praise the quality. And the right lung base looks pretty clear on this radiograph, but I think there was probably already something there because here's a CT from just five days later. And um, in this uh, AML neutropenic patient, and here we have this ill-defined mass, maybe some ground glass around it. So potentially fungal lesions right sitting right on top of Mr. Diaphragm down there. And then, um, you know, here's what it looked like a little while later. So that was June the 16th, here's three weeks later, and you can see that this has evolved, and now there's now some cavitation, and seems to be a lot of debris in the cavity down here. So still thinking fungus, and so they went through everything, and um, this uh, turns out to be another case of Sketosporium apiospermum, which is an allomorph of Pseudaloshuria voidii, which I've seen in cases of, uh, say, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, where instead of being aspergillus in the mucus plug, it was Pseudaloshuria boidii. So though th these are considered different uh, maturity phases of the same organism. So Sketosporium, Apiospermum, and Pseudaloshuria boidii are probably the same thing, just different morphologies depending on how mature they are and things like that. But uh, Sketosporium is a very difficult to treat. And so th this fellow has been on antifungals, but you know this st stuff just keeps limping along. It's there several weeks later. It's really hard to clear it up. So it's well known as a cause of mycetoma. And I've seen it in, in uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is in that setting, not really aspergillosis, but the same idea. And it can also be an invasive infection in immune compromised, in particular hosts, but sometimes in immune competent hosts too. So it's not just compromised people who can get this. So you can be have immune competency and still get this organism. So Sketosporium apiospermum. So, so it's a fungus different from rhizopus. I forget the families and things, but yeah, it's considered different from that. So here's a person, another AML neutropenic patient who developed um, this ill-defined blob near the right chest wall and also has one anteriorly here on, on the left. So it looks like this is quite good for, for fungus and um, the right time course. And then we have a very nice avian finding here of the bird's nest. So uh, here's a nice bird's nest with this thick, dense rind. Can have some ground glass around it, but you get this kind of lacy, like inner, you know, twigs intertwined here in the center of this, the classic for mucor. Okay, uh, then on the left, there's more of a peribronchial infection going on here. So this really has a different kind of morphology, but could all be the same organism. So um, everybody, you know, seized on mucor for this. So they did extensive PCRs and things like that, and they never could identify any mucor uh, DNA. And they eventually, on the nocardia plate, it wasn't nocardia either, the only thing that grew out was on the nocardia plate, and that was a fungus called Phanero uh, sordida. I like the sordida part, you know, it means something is sorted there. It's fairly gross. And this fellow um, has not done very well. So a while later, um, you see that there's obvious progression here and now we have this big pneumonia going on here so this thing has not gone away there's some cavitation or little remnant bird's nest laciness there and accompanying pleural effusions and the last radiograph we have which is fairly current shows is extensive consolidation in the right lung so aggressive antifungal therapy you know seems to be losing the battle against this 
at presentation on the earliest CT, this thing had probably already cost, crossed fissures. So one of the treatments for mucor, of course, is doing a lobectomy, but it was probably too late. It was in contact with chest wall. It had already crossed fissures. It might have involved all three lobes at that point, at the early point um, on CT. So this is an organism I've not heard of before. The only thing that grew out of this, you know, we're expecting some sort of classic, classic mucor, but we got this Fanero Kiti sorted out. And I haven't read up on that organism, but it's probably something filamentous and um, a filament, it's probably a mold that's similar in many ways to um, things that would be a classic mucor. David, so, <clears throat> um, yeah. Can I show a quick companion case? I don't have, I'm sort of like, you actually grew out something, but I, was, I have another bird's nest that I've been, I finally was able to track down the rest okay. of it. If you don't mind real quickly, I'll just show, because um, you had such a nice bird's nest, but uh, this is a bigger bird. And this That's was also nest. a patient and looks all the world like mucor. Um, wow. Nothing ever, they could never culture anything, but uh, the beta one, three, whatever, diglucan was positive, which, doesn't mean a lot. Um, so I wonder if um, this patient had been on like posiconazole, one of the more uh, active um, um, antifungals. And it makes me wonder if um, when it's just like with the antibiotics, you just sometimes can't culture it out. Right. Well, one of the problems with this organism, Jeff, is that it, it really is embedded in tissue. Right. And it's very hard to wash it out in a, in a lavar. So I've seen a number of cases in which they did not make the, the diagnosis until they had a surgical specimen or they had autopsy mm -hmm. because they really couldn't get it uh, on Lavar. So that's that that to me is an indication that what you're dealing with is mucor when they can't get it with Lavage. Right. Because aspergillus is usually pretty easy to recover. Yeah. For some we've reason. Had I, success. Go ahead. We've we've done FNAs on several of these birds' nests and had some success growing things, often mucor, but sometimes <laughs> rare bugs that are also zygomycetes. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, it, we do it because the patients are on amphotericin and and the clinicians you know feel the the risk of that is higher than the risk of the biopsy, even if they're thrombocytopenic and and whatnot. Well, the other the other problem with the biopsy is that you create a nice track for this organism that loves to invade adjacent tissue. Okay. Oh. All right. Let me uh, let me show you another another case here. Um, this woman came in with this um, lesion at the right base, which is very nicely marginated here implying that it's something outside the lung and uh, there was a CT scan of course and this this person was referred in they I somehow there was a very confident diagnosis of solitary fibrous tumor here it is on the coronal uh, CT let me show you cross sections which will be better um, but this very smooth lesion very homogeneous um, and uh, really abutting the chest wall, I thought this was going to be a neural tumor rather than a neural rather than a uh, a solitary fibrous tumor. And it got a needle biopsy. And what do you think the result was? It was a neurofibroma. Okay. <laughs> so um, it looks like a neurofibroma. Wouldn't you guys leap on neurofibroma first off or schwannoma ahead of solitary fibrous tumor? Just Is it remodeling the rib? The undersurface. Uh, you know, it's it's got this broad contact. It seems to be bulging into the chest. Wall. That was one of the things that pushed me toward a neural tumor. See how it bulges? Yeah, more chest wall than plural there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, there's some point in having radiologists, even when you're dealing with you know sophisticated surgeons. So I just feel as if I just earned my paycheck for favoring. But I kept quiet about this until the results were in, and then of course I let everybody know. That's um, that's the way you play the game. Okay, so um, speaking of uh, plural thingies, um, this guy came in, this chest radiographer, this fellow with uh, chest pain, chest, left chest and right neck pain, was seeing the sports med clinic. And I noticed this bumpy thing down here, and it's posterior mostly. I thought, could this be a little boctolic hernia? It's kind of a strange angle with diaphragm. 
for a blocked elect hernia, which usually more flows into the adjacent diaphragm contour, just doesn't quite do that. And then this person got a CT, of course, and it turns out that this is a really messy looking thing down here. It's very, it's very extensive. There seems to be a blob up here as well that's separate from it. Um, it's hard to tell what this is. Um, so, what do you think? When was the spleen taken yeah. out? When was the spleen? <laughs> or when did it explode? <laughs> well, um, it turns out that he was shot uh, several years ago, and um, he did have splenectomy after that. And uh, he does have this big amorphous blob down there. But this, I've never seen splenosis of this extent. Have you? Yeah, that's quite a big one. Yeah, it's you a big wonder, You wonder yeah. if there was a hole in the diaphragm and, at the time, and the, right. most of the splenic fragments just entered the chest. Right. And that's, that must be the case, because here's the nuclear study that this uh, uh, reticular endothelial imaging lighting up the liver and what would be the spleen, but instead it's this all this stuff that's transposed into the left chest. And there was some other deposits scattered around the abdomen. There's something near the gastroepiploic ligament and things like that. So there are several other deposits that you're right, the spleen had gone sort of everywhere. And then, you know, what was what could be removed of spleen was, but this stuff seeded the other location. So this is the most blobby, extensive splenosis case that I've um, that I've seen. So the nuclear study was definitive. Now, I, because this is symptomatic, I don't know what the approach is going to be, um, whether there's a, uh, some point in trying to resect this or whether this is just going to be a, a bloody mess if they try to do that. I don't really know what the treatment would be for a case like this. So right now, this is pretty fresh diagnosis, and there isn't a decision I know about about uh, how to approach this. Okay, those are, uh, those are my cases. All right, Jeff, Jeff, can I show one really quick? Is sure, there an we'll to that? All right, so this is obviously a, a photo of an image. This is from my former fellow who's still at Emory. And this was sent to me a couple of weeks ago because I guess this patient was sent to Emory with a presumptive diagnosis of mesothelioma or cancer. And my colleague Scott suggested the alternative and eventual correct answer based on this radiograph. So here you can see much clearer evidence that the spleen was was disrupted. And then these were all splenic deposits. And then I think he sent me one image of this the subcutaneous splenic tissue as well. So another splenosis, not pleural metastatic disease. You know, whereas the, the case that I said, I that I showed was a, I think a 22 caliber bullet. I would say that in the south, there you guys don't mess around. This is very <laughs> that was a range. Just look at that was, look that's at the pretty close range with the shotgun. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. A little bit of bird shot. Shooting. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. Jeff. Let's go on to Howard. Your posterior um, entry for that. You don't have uh, a lot. Good question. No, I'll here. I'll look while. I think it's posterior. Yeah, based on that CT, he but. was running. Okay, I'll start with this one. I'm curious. Start with the ultrasound. Uh, so here we have, I have to get my bearings, RVRA, LVLA, and you will see this round thing in the left atrium, and it will bump through in part the valve into the RV. So we have a very mobile atrial abnormality there. And she was referred from the outside with the diagnosis. And I'll show you some clinical information in a moment. Here is the CT. Here is the right atrial abnormality there. Let me just change the window if I can a bit better. And you'll see the extent of it. 
and you'll see right away it's also associated with rather large pulmonary emboli. So this, of course, now turns out to be a clot in the heart. I just want to move something aside here so I can get to my control panel here. So this is curious, this is a person that um, had an illness previously. Sorry, that's not the one I wanted to show you. Let's let me just go back to um, the right one. I can find that. Let's see. Sorry. And it's not that one either. So this is the one here. So the person was ill back in February with that history, and then more recently presented with this. So this turns out to be a large clot with PE, and you can see that they decided to remove it, what procedure they did to remove that. So rather large, turned out to be a fibrillant clot. They had to do a fair amount of surgery to get that out. So rather curious, I don't know why this person presented with with this right atrial thrombus rather large. What there is about this context that results in that, but that's what it turned out to be. Um, is, that what is that what PATH said it was? Um, it was, yes. So that this was um, both the operative diagnosis as well as pathology. So I think they're, saying it looked like, they're saying it looked like a clot, but did the PATH say? Because I mean, man, I've never seen yes. a clot mobile like that before. Yeah. Right. No, I do have the PATH report. I didn't put it there for some reason, but that was exactly that on PATH as well. Described as fibrin clot. Yep. Huh. So that's curious, isn't it? Let me just show it again. Yep, that's the ultrasound that came, came with uh, the patient. Just a big clot. Did they say it was coming from the SVC and attached to the crista? Where, did they say where it was attached to? Let's was it attached the, to the crista? It was um, stuck It was a tail the... going all the way up the SVC and now I'm going to jump. Really? Yeah. Removed it by doing a kind of hand out of it. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. On the PE study, can you see the clot in the uh, SVC? Uh, it know it's coming up here. Is there a tail of it coming right up into here? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, and he's got massive PE, too. I didn't even see uh, that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was just kind of looking at the echo. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really yeah. impressive. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of PE. Yeah. Exactly. So curious, huh? Watching yeah, so it probably was just dangling from the SVC and not attached to the septum. Kind of on the echo, it looked like it was attached to the septum, but I uh, guess not. Yeah, yeah. So here is a uh, patient with, a young patient with a lot of lung disease. And, you know, how would one characterize this? I think the dominant finding, at least two dominant findings, is one diffuse pulmonary hyperattenuation abnormality. The lungs are gray, just diffusely gray. And then, of course, we have fairly extensive cystic disease and a very strange distribution in the anterior left upper lobe, particularly. There's some in the right middle lobe, and some elsewhere, but mostly in those locations. And then we have some strange findings here in the uh, right lung. Let's see if I can get to that one place where I saw that. That turned out to have some air trapping associated with it that was over here. And I thought on another scan, there was some bronchi that may have contained some interluminal material. The patient also has, and I'll show you the history in a moment, quite a lot of lymph node enlargement. So there is both intrathoracic lymph node enlargement, but even on the lung windows, you can appreciate that there is a lot of axillary lymph node enlargement. And I was able to confirm that these findings have been present for a long time, including the lymph node enlargement from like 2012. And the lung disease has been not terribly progressive for a long period of time. 
Uh, this is what a chest radiograph shows. And the patient does have pulmonary hypertension. So the lip pulmonary arteries are also enlarged as well as the lung disease and the lymph nodes. So here the clinical context is a person with, let's get my orientation, make sure I'm showing the right patient, a patient with systemic idiopathic juvenile arthritis, Stills disease. And you know, typically they don't have as part of their illness and they have all kinds of things, including episodes of macrophage activation syndrome, pulmonary disease, because they have the arthritis, they may have skin lesions, and she's had that, but she definitely has rather severe pulmonary disease. Um, so I don't think I've ever seen a case of that before. Here is one article that I found that does talk about pulmonary disease in this entity. And How old is this patient, Howard? This patient is young. I'll go back in a moment. She's, I think, in I, her 20s. In her I, 20s. Would, I would have them do a COPA gene mutation analysis. As well? I, I think this could be another COPA syndrome case. Yeah, ours was, no, I showed one a couple of while ago that you told me it was COPA and it turned out to be. It was? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I left to think about that because I think the diagnosis of, of this well, entity is a pretty firm one. Clinically. Well, but the, the issue with the, the COPA syndrome is like the, before it was even discovered in 2015, they were all juvenile rheumatoid arthritis because they have rheumatologic symptoms, they have inflammatory arthritis, and this oh. is how their lung disease starts with tons of tiny little central lobular nodules. And usually it's even patients that are younger than this, but I would not be surprised if, you know, they may need to do a further genetic analysis to, because sure. it's, since it's a familial disease, it can have issues for the rest of the family. And Yeah. Huh. I have to think about that. Um, do you recall for that whether they have lymph node enlargement? Because her lymph nodes, intrathoracic and extrathoracic, have been there a long time. And certainly in stills, one can get lymphadenopathy. That isn't malignant lymphadenopathy. That may be chronic. And was this patient a non-smoker too? This person is a uh, non-smoker. She's young. Yeah, that's exactly what ours looked like. It looked like bad fight emphysema was scarring and all this weird stuff. And it, Travis brought it up and got tested. Yeah, but she doesn't have any oh, kids, yeah. so yeah, I never even heard of it until yeah. the conference. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna think about that. Yeah, well, it's it's one of you know we're gonna see more diseases like this. I think so. It was one of our pulmonologists that in his lab they just were doing whole genome sequencing in some of these patients and just discovered this gene in a bunch of them. So. Okay, mental note, I'm gonna let you know about that. I'm asking to think about that. What you can the, find a few articles. Sorry, go ahead. Does anybody know what the gene does? I mean, what is it part of the uh, immune response to things? It. I need to think about it. Okay. It's it's something because it's kind of like an inflammatory, inflammatory and autoimmune combined disease. I'll, I'll look it up while how it goes on. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, let's see which one is. Okay. This is just a, kind of a reminder again of. Um, don't dismiss opacities. So let me go back in time to 2018. And this, I don't know the entire context, but this is the bottom of the chest on an abdominal CT. Let me go back and uh, show you this. And of course, I don't know what diagnosis to make, but this is the bottom of a abdominal CT. And this is the finding with the opacity with some cavitation or pseudo cavitation within. And I presume, given the context, that that wasn't paid much attention to. I speculate, I don't really know. So, of course, I'm going to show you over time what that develops into. So, this is going to 2019 now, and you'll see that it is 
that. There's more opacity surrounding that. And then not to belabor this, I'll go all the way to the most recent. And the diagnosis is finally made with a lot of a lot of disease with erogenous spread to multiple lobes from this adenocarcinoma down there. So I don't know if this is amusing producing, but certainly one can really intuit that it's spreading via airways to multiple locations over time. So adenocarcinoma over some years. Now this case is uh, really just very weird. So um, I'll withhold some information for the moment. The only finding which is really visible on this patient on a lateral projection only is in this patient with a CRTD device, hence leads in right atrial appendage RV and a coronary vein. And you'll be really lucky to see this. So let me just try and make this up for you. Um, the only object that is puzzling that shouldn't be there and how to connect that up with anything is just elusive. So here is a catheter or a piece of plastic in that location. And the patient was sent here with additional information and I will show you the CT that will show us where things are and what that is you will see that that object is down here and it is right there. So it is partly in the heart, partly outside of the heart, way outside of the heart, as well as some blood presumably in the pericardium. So very strange how you have a piece of plastic but literally, I don't know how this happened, but it was in the context of a lead revision and somehow a sheath, part of the sheath ended up there. And as you can see from this art report, it was removed right there. So I don't How know do what to make it, of that. It, when they were strange placing the lead, they sheared off the sheath and carried them down? Somehow the sheath got sheared off, but it, had it, you know, it ended up penetrating the heart like that. I don't know if it's a um, piece of plastic that's fairly rigid or sharp and it looks like look where it ended up. Yeah, almost looks more like wire, but. Yeah, but it's, it's a Great. sheath and it's described as, as a sheath. Yeah, interesting. So, so uh, uh, Howard, your notion yes. is that this, that this thing was in the heart and then worked its way through the apex into the chest wall, it wasn't part of a pericardial drainage procedure going the no, other way. No, it wasn't. That we know of, no. That would have Somehow been, that would have way been something. Hard. Yeah. Strange. Okay. Yeah. So rather disconcerting complication of a procedure requiring a surgical fix. Okay, those are my cases. Jeff? And I have oh, to think great. about the code. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It is the top of the hour. So, uh, Peter and um, Brian, if you have cases, we can definitely start with you guys next week or whenever you're next on. Really, Jeff, really sure. quick the COPA syndrome. So, it's yeah. immune mediated, it's dysregulation of the immune system, it has to do with the Golgi complex and the endoplasmic reticulum. But the patients often develop autoantibodies, including ANCA and ANAs. And they can be RF rheumatoid factor positive as well. Cool. So it doesn't help that much. But. If that plays a role in other autoimmune diseases, that we set pathway. Yep. Cool. Makes but, you wonder. Um, I agree. The don't have these things, right? The macrophage activation syndrome, the liver disease. The oh no. That, and the lymph node enlargement and the skin disease. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, yeah, it's just with the, the way that the way that lung looks. Yeah, you would think of that, huh? Yeah, I suggested the possibility of lymphoma, and then I even speculated that she might have an iatrogenic immunodeficiency-associated lymphoma because of very 
chronic immunosuppression, although she hadn't been on an immunosuppressive drug for about one year. But then I found a CT from the outside in which these lymph nodes hadn't changed for about a year or more, or even longer. Very interesting, huh? It's certainly bad disease. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Thanks. Um, we'll talk to everybody next week. And again, Brian and Peter, you guys can go first next week or the next time you're on. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, guys. No worries. Okay.